Thanks very much. Yes, 2020 was an eventful and often tragic year. But through it all, I will remain forever grateful for receiving this award in recognition of my life's work. This is likely the most important honor in my professional career. But today, I don't wish to talk about me. I'd rather talk about you, this society, and its many contributions, as seen through the lens of pioneers, presidents, and prescient luminaries. This is my disclosure slide. Unfortunately, 2020 was also a time of great sadness for ISHLT. Dr. David Taylor, renowned heart failure cardiologist and a dear friend of mine died early in 2020 following complications of influenza. David was a past president and longtime leader and mentor within the society. Past recipients of the Lifetime Achievement Award are men and women whose visions were not limited by prevailing attitudes and expectations. They were driven by their overwhelming compassion for those dying of advanced heart and lung failure, determined to steal survivor from the jaws of death. The history of our society and of the remarkable therapies for advanced heart and lung failure is a concatenation of stories inextricably intertwined, yet often occurring in parallel universes. To be a pioneer and provide major contributions, there must be an opportunity, and with its skill, vision, and preparation. ISHLT is a widely diverse organization whose history is rich and complex and not possible to do justice in a 25 minute talk. So I'd like to just share with you some thoughts from my eyes as a combatant in this field and as a past president. Fittingly, the first recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award was Norman Shumway. During the 1960s, Shumway and Richard Lauer at Stanford were paving the way for clinical heart transplantation with extensive laboratory experiments. Shumway's team performed the first American heart transplant in January of 1968. You know, the key uh, to Shumway's program was always a, a careful methodical approach that was thoroughly grounded in, in careful lab laboratory work. Nothing ever happened in the operating room that hadn't been carefully worked out in that. The world's historic first human heart transplant was in 1967. So what was happening that year? Well, an Apollo 1 fire killed three astronauts. The US began the largest offensive of the Vietnam War. Major racial discord in the US with rioting in more than 10 cities. The US and Soviet Union both performed major nuclear bomb testing. As for me, I was immersed in springboard and tower diving at Ohio State University, having recently placed fourth in the National College Diving Championships. Well, the seminal event of Barnard's first human heart transplant on December 3rd, 1967, captured the imagination of the entire world. Barnard was later recognized as one of the first Pioneer Award recipients. Just one year earlier, Michael DeBakey used a ventricular assist device for a patient unable to come off the heart-lung machine after cardiac surgery. <clears throat> the patient was supported for 10 days and was a long-term survivor. And the early vision of a total artificial heart was articulated by DeBakey in the 1960s. We should be able to develop a pump, mechanical pump, that will substitute for the heart. So I'm, and I'm convinced this can be done. Denton Cooley implanted the first total artificial heart in 1969 using DeBakey's Leota artificial heart. In the transplant world, Sharon Hunt at Stanford 
was one of the first cardiologists to specialize in the care of heart transplant recipients. She spoke about the development of criteria for brain death, which was critical for the clinical reality of heart transplantation. Were there issues around the, the brain death? Was that coming back uh, in the press and, and oh with challenges? Goodness. Yes, uh, at one point, uh, Dr. Shumway was indicted for murder uh, in San Jose. Uh, that was eventually dropped, but the contention was that uh, it wasn't the guy who shot the donor, it was uh, the man who took out his heart. And ultimately, as you well know, there were uh, uh, at the federal level uh, pronouncements of the what constitute the concept of brain death. And it was really the field of heart transplantation that pushed the, uh, the creation of those standards. But heart transplantation entered a dark era in the 1970s when only Stanford and a handful of centers worldwide persisted in the face of inadequate immunosuppression and poor survival. You discussed your experiences in the early 1970s, yet during that five-year period, the results were horrible in heart transplantation. How did you persist with your interest in cardiac transplantation when most of the patients were dying? The two-year survival was 11%. Boom phenomenon that you could take somebody who was moribund and dying, I mean, literally gasping their last breath, in a much worse state than we would transplant people now. I mean, it's swollen all over, absolutely short of breath, uh, unable to walk or get out of bed. And within a few days after transplantation, convert them into somebody that was walking around uh, conversing normally, off oxygen. And some amazing things were quietly ongoing at Stanford during the 1970s. Margaret Billingham was building the foundations for the histologic diagnosis of cardiac rejection. Philip Caves is the namesake of the Caves Award, which honors his pioneering contributions in the development of a biotome in 1972 for the transvenous sampling of endomyocardium for the detection of allograft rejection. <clears throat> These and other seminal events chartered a course in heart transplantation in the, that led to the genesis of the International Society for Heart Transplantation. The initial meeting was held in March of 1981. Well, the first uh, <clears throat> meeting that Michael Hess called was in Miami in November 1980. Then mm. they had a second meeting in Chicago, uh, which I was informed about and aware of, uh, which was to plan the first meeting of the society, because that first one was just a group gathering and, and so on. So they met in Chicago, and uh, uh, where Jacques Lozman was the host, and they really, they, they, they did an extraordinary amount at that meeting. They planned the program. They decided that there was a need for a registry and they were going to draft that and they were going to draft the first uh, <clears throat> constitution of the society. Two major treasures of our society are the journal and our transplant registry. The journal was initiated in 1981 with Jacques Losman as editor. And the Heart Transplant Registry began collecting cases in 1983 under the direction of Michael Kay. And so the, dec the first decade of ISHLT leadership included early pioneers in the field, Michael Hess, Jack Copeland, Terence English, Stuart Jameson, and Bruno Reichardt. Soon after the formation of a society, the seminal development for the entire field of thoracic transplantation occurred in 1983, when cyclosporin received FDA approval for clinical use. Within months, heart transplant programs were developed and reactivated worldwide, including our own at UAB, under the leadership of myself and my colleague, David McGiffin. With the availability of cyclosporin at Stanford, Bruce writes, 
a Pioneer Award recipient, led an experimental and clinical team that performed the first successful heart-lung transplant. Similarly, the availability of cyclosporin allowed the research group in Toronto, led by Pioneer Award recipient Joel Cooper, to perform a successful single lung transplant in 1983 and double lung transplant in 1986. His colleague, Alec Patterson, also a pioneer in lung transplantation, would later become president of ISHLT. <clears throat> Adrian Kantrowitz. Though he was recognized for his lifetime of contributions, he was largely a forgotten man in the world of pediatric heart transplantation. But it was he who attempted the first human infant heart transplant just three days after Barnard's historic case in a neonate with Ed's Epstein's anomaly. Unfortunately, the baby died shortly after the operation from acute graft failure. Although numerous pediatric heart transplants were performed over the next 17 years, the paradigm shift in infant transplants would await the clinical experiment of Leonard Bailey and his colleagues at Loma Linda. In October of 1984, <clears throat> Bailey performed a neonatal heart transplant on baby Faye using a baboon heart. <clears throat> the baby survived for 21 days and on autopsy, the heart was free of rejection. Even though the baby died and Bailey would never perform another xenotransplant, he ushered in the era of infant heart transplantation. I think it was at the hospital for sick children that I, it occurred to me that, that newborn babies might benefit from this technology as well. By that time, heart transplantation in young adults was beginning to get some traction. And uh, what I observed at SickKid was that the single ventricle babies with hypoplastic left heart syndrome would be born and they would die all within the same week ordinarily, and no matter what we did. And uh, so in the back of my mind, the idea was to put transplantation together with these babies and I didn't know a lot about their naive immune systems at the time, perhaps still don't, but uh, it seemed like a natural setting for transplantation. Another major breakthrough in pediatric heart transplantation occurred later in 2001, when Lori West and colleagues in Toronto reported successful infant heart transplantation with ABO incompatible donors, a major step toward increasing the infant donor pool. <clears throat> in recent years, the research group of past President Bruno Reichardt has made important ongoing contributions in genetically engineered pig to primate heart transplants. In a parallel universe during the 1980s, the widespread clinical application of clinical support devices would be driven by the large number of patients dying on transplant waiting lists and by a small community of engineers who had a vision for long-term mechanical circulatory support. <clears throat> These innovations paved the way for the first application of pulsatile LVADs for bridge to transplant therapy in 1984 and clinical use of the first continuous flow pump in 1988. In 1985, Jack Copeland would first implant a total artificial heart as a successful bridge to heart transplantation. Bud Frazier, recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award, was a major contributor and pioneer from the earliest days of MCS. But once we, you know, we got that, uh, the pneumatically powered TCI uh, Crude, and I put in the first electrical. You know, the goal was we had to get the patient out of the hospital. And it still was goal was for a long term device. And uh, I'd started doing the heart transplants and the cyclists born in 1982. And of course, it's very dramatic when they start out and you see these patients. But again, if you do enough, you start seeing them die of premature deaths. So I uh, still, you know, really we wanted something 
like for the Italian boy, you could pull off the shell. And, uh, and, and so we continued with that therapy and we, we finally got a patient, uh, uh, man named Mike Templeton out of the hospital with the electric powered TCI. Many of the contributors during the early era of innovation would assume the presidency of ISHLT in the 1990s. Margaret Billingham, Christian Cabral, Jack O'Connell, Eric Rose, John Walwork, Sharon Hunt, and William Baumgartner. In 1992, the society made a major commitment to long-term growth and stability with the selection of Amanda Rowe as its executive director, a position she would hold for the next 28 years. What, what were the highlights of your year as ISHLT president? What were the issues that you really had to... Well, the first highlight was an organizational issue. Uh, we were unhappy with our uh, managing company. Uh, and it was a painful and legal decision to uh, uh, get rid of them and move in a different direction. And I remember when Amanda Rowe walked into my office and uh, I was actually chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Mississippi then. And she had, we just hired her as the uh, new executive director of the organization. And it was, she was impressive from day one. And I knew that her vision of this organization was the right vision for us. During the 1990s, heart failure cardiologists began to develop the specialty of transplant cardiology. Les Miller, was instrumental in that process. It really was um, an early time in about the mid 80s when everybody it was really pretty sparse in terms of cardiologists involved in the field of transplant and mechanical support. And uh, we hosted a meeting in St. Louis of the 15 or so people I could identify around the country. And as such, that began and became quite a network and then evolved into being the working group of transplant cardiologists and then finally the cardiac transplant research database. So that was the evolution of solidifying heart failure as a discipline within heart transplantation and mechanical support. And uh, it's grown to be quite now. During the presidency of Alan Menkes, the first Lifetime Achievement Award was presented to Norman Shumway as the father of clinical heart transplantation. Bob Cormos helped establish a scientific council for mechanical circulatory support. <clears throat> and during the presidency of Ann Keogh, ISHLT became a platform for progress in pulmonary hypertension. Jim Young guided the society through the global challenges of 9-11. During his presidency, an MCS registry was formalized. And Stefan Schuler, following his presidency, became a longtime advocate for MCS within the society. The transition into the new millennium was highlighted by possibly the most impactful clinical trial in the history of MCS. With past president Eric Rose as the PI, the rematch trial paved the way for approval of an LVAD for long-term heart failure therapy. While these rapid paradigm shifts were occurring in adult MCS, the pediatric world was lagging behind. In this 2006 publication, Betsy Bloom and colleagues lamented the poor survival in children under age 10 being supported by adult devices. But the field of pediatric MCS would forever change with the development of the first real pediatric longer term ventricular assist device, the Berlin Heart. After its introduction in Germany in 1990 and subsequent design changes, Jack Copeland implanted the first device in the US in 1998. Our group was keenly interested in bridging your transplant patients with congenital heart disease and decompensated heart failure. The support of patients with single ventricle physiology was especially vexing and in 2009, we were first to successfully bridge a baby with single ventricle to successful transplantation with a more durable Berlin heart. Two years later, we were faced with a difficult dilemma of a nine-year-old girl admitted in cardiogenic shock with a thromboembolic stroke. After emergent 
clot extraction, we performed North America's first pediatric implant of the HFAD. And she had, was successfully transplanted two months later. Now, 10 years later, she is a normal young adult with no neurologic deficit, studying to be a children's minister. In the 1990s, John Kavashagawa was a driving force in the grading of cardiac allograft rejection, dedicating a major thrust of his career to addressing the diagnostic and therapeutic challenges of antibody-mediated rejection. The first decade of the new millennium was, saw a major increase in ISHLT guidelines as the field of thoracic transplantation matured. Between 2002 and 2007, 20 guideline documents were published in JHLT during the presidencies of Stefan Schuler, John Kubashigawa, Alec Patterson, Mark Barr, Bobby Robbins, and Paul Corus. The origins of rigorous long-term data collection in MCS patients dates back to a vision of Dr. John Watson of the NIH. In 1991, I was on the Institute of Medicine Total Artificial Heart Committee that recommended routine long-term data collection on these patients. Watson and his colleagues at the NIH had a vision to develop a national database to track MCS patients. In yet another universe, the Congenital Heart Surgeons Society during the early 1980s, through the pioneering efforts of my father and Gene Blackstone, generated the first multi-institutional analyses to develop risk models for outcomes after congenital heart operations. Inspired by their experience and collaborating with my close colleague, statistician David Naftal and heart failure cardiologist Robert Borge, we initiated the Multi-Institutional Cardiac Transplant Research Database, first in 1990. This was followed by the Multi-Institutional Pediatric Heart Transplant Study in 1993, with the additional collaboration of Dr. Bob Morrow and other colleagues in pediatric heart failure cardiology. The first Multi-Institutional Pediatric Heart Transplant Research effort evolved into the Pediatric Heart Transplant Society, which includes over 50 US and international centers and has generated seminal outcomes research for nearly 30 years. With the approval of the HeartMate XVE for long-term destination therapy in 2003, the NIH was poised to begin long-term studies and data collection on durable devices. In 2005, they put out an RFP for a national database. With the support of a number of colleagues within ISHLT, our group at UAB applied for and was awarded the NHLBI contract to build a national MCS database. This was the inception of Intermax, a unique collaboration between the NIH and other stakeholders. And Intermax was the impetus for other valuable databases, PDMAX for pediatric MCS, Metamax for medical therapy for advanced heart failure, and IMAX within ISHLT for international device use. The Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation has been the dominant platform for the preclinical -pre and clinical science of heart and lung transplantation and MCS for the past 20 years. By 2020, during the editorial tenure of Mandeep Mira, JHLT was consistently ranked number one in impact factor among transplant journals. The major impact of lung transplants in the evolving field of thoracic transplantation was especially apparent in the second decade of the new millennium, with the election of six lung transplant experts to the presidency of ISHLT, John Dark, Alan Glanville, Herman Reichensperner, Dwayne Davis, Andy Fisher, and Stuart Sweet. As IHLT became the dominant society in a now mature field of thoracic transplantation and MCS, leaders of other major transplant societies such as Merrill Johnson and Stuart Sweet 
assumed the leadership role at ISHLT. And most recently, the changing environment of social professional interactions was embraced by ISHLT leaders, Jeff Tudorberg, Stuart Sweet, and Joe Rogers, as the society undertook a major strategic and structural reorganization. So I wanna thank all of my friends and colleagues at ISHLT for their many contributions in the battle against advanced heart and lung failure, for the incredible history of this field and this society, and for the platforms that will educate and inspire future generations of physicians, scientists, and other healthcare providers in these fields. And particularly in these challenging times, leisure activities and quality time with family and friends are so important. For our family, our ocean adventures, have forged indelible memories, but each of you will form your own memories and adventures imprinted alongside the fabric of the ISHLT family and most important, your own. Thank you very much. <laughs>